Coming up ahead in this episode of X Talk Spotlight. No one data set is going to fit for every purpose. And I think that's where you have to start. You have to start with the question or the hypothesis or whatever it is you're looking to address that you're going to use data for. And then once you've established that, then you've got to work through a rubric, right? And every organization should really focus on a key set of questions that they ask themselves and they ask the data before they get started. Hello and welcome to X Talk Spotlight, illuminating insights from subject matter experts and industry thought leaders. I'm Sonia Hunt. In this episode, we're asking the question, how does purpose transform data into impact in real-world evidence generation? Real-world evidence depends on capturing data that shows how treatments work in everyday practice. But much of that data is hidden in clinical notes and imaging reports. And the split in the data limits how well researchers understand patient journeys, disease progression, and outcomes. In this X Talk Spotlight, I spoke with Lou Brooks Jr., Senior Vice President, Real World Data and Analytics at Optum Life Sciences. During our conversation, we explored what it means to make data fit for purpose and how Optum is building clinical enrichments to unlock deeper insights. We also discussed why these efforts matter now and how they help life science teams turn complexity into clarity and data into meaningful impact. Thank you for taking the time for the Spotlight interview, Lou. So, I mean, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to our discussion. So, Lou, let's start with the big picture. When we say where data meets purpose, what does that mean to you? Many times when we think about using data, we don't necessarily think through clearly what we want to use it for. And I'll, I'll use an analogy as a great way to start this. Imagine that you have a very small, very thin finish nail that you want to knock into your trim. You wouldn't use a 10 pound sledgehammer to do that. It's not gonna work properly, right? You're gonna find the right tool to actually drive that nail in. And data is much the same way. You've got business questions. You need to make sure that the data that you are utilizing or contemplating utilizing actually can do the things and answer the questions that you are seeking to ask. And that's really the critical aspect of this. Too many projects get started without a clear set of thinking around what are the business questions, what are the key elements that I need, and then making sure that data meets the purpose that I'm trying to uh, utilize it for. And building on that, what is the philosophy behind making data truly fit for purpose? That's a pretty broad question, but I'll try to boil it down into a, a few key pieces. The first is no one data set is going to fit for every purpose. And I think that's where you have to start. You have to start with the question or the hypothesis or whatever it is you're looking to address that you're going to use data for. And then once you've established that, then you've got to work through a rubric, right? And every organization should really focus on a key set of questions that they ask themselves and they ask the data before they get started. So if you're looking for, let's say, certain types of measures or observations, things like height, weight, um, BMI, blood pressure, you know, other readings that are collected uh, at the point of care, then you don't want to use a claims asset because that information isn't available. That data is constructed for billing purposes. So you want to find a data asset that has those key observational measures and make sure that you've got a clarity between the particular data elements that you're interested in to address your hypotheses, 
with the data assets that you are evaluating to support that particular analytic project. If you don't do that in advance, then you may find yourself halfway through the project realizing that you can't complete it because you don't have the right information. And the key thing to note, just like beauty being in the eye of the beholder, fit for purpose is in the eye of who's ever using the data. There, you know, that isn't something that a data organization can necessarily just say, oh yeah, my data is fit for purpose. You have to actually ask the right questions to make that determination. And it's the end user that's ultimately in that position to make that determination versus anyone else uh, in the healthcare system. Now, on the practical side, can you walk us through some of the clinical enrichments being developed to strengthen evidence generation? Certainly. I think that as we think about the evolution of data over time, you know, for, for many, many years, claims data was the standard uh, from a data perspective. You know, thousands of studies published um, or, or created uh, for internal purposes, um, all based on administrative health claims data. And then, you know, in the 2005, 2007 time period, electronic medical record and electronic health record data started to become more prevalent. Um, in today, it is utilized quite frequently. And even looking at that source, there are gaps in information. There's only so much data collected in structured fields. And getting to the details that a provider, doctor, a nurse practitioner, physician's assistant, a nurse are documenting in the unstructured portion or the notes of that particular electronic medical record system is essential to filling in those gaps. And when we think about enrichments, it starts there. And it's about building a more comprehensive picture of what's going on with a patient's care beyond what is just captured in the hard-coded fields in an electronic medical record. And then it builds from there. Enrichment doesn't stop by just looking at unstructured data. It also seeks data from other sources, whether that be genomic information, imaging data, information that you're collecting off of a smartwatch. Um, you know, all of those pieces can be tied back to a, a focus of enriching the data. It's related to fit for purpose. Those enrichments are only valuable if they support the purposes that people and the business questions that people are trying to address. But ideally, setting up the framework to facilitate the ability to increase the comprehensiveness of the data by pulling in information from notes using, let's say, advanced analytic techniques or human intervention um, to bringing in other data assets and connecting it to that foundational asset are essential for us to continue to be able to support the more precise research questions and hypotheses that we're being asked to address as part of making the healthcare system work better for everyone. And Lou, why is this the right time to invest in clinical enrichments for real world data? I think the, the key piece here is that organizations need to be thinking about the life cycle of their products well in advance. It takes time to build these enrichments. They don't happen overnight, right? Could be 30 days, 60 days, sometimes as long as six to nine months, depending on what you're actually doing. And so what we advocate to our clients is that as they're thinking about their products and their strategies for the future, in terms of, of making those products available, marketing those products, and socializing them to, to the healthcare system. You've got to think through what are the questions that you think you might need? What's the data that you might need in the future? Right? Today, the product just gets launched. You might not need much in the real world way, the way of real world data, because you've got your clinical trial data that you're supporting all of your statements, your label, et cetera on. But over time, 
you may find, well, you know what? I'm going to need a head-to-head comparison, or maybe I need a, a, a safety study, or maybe I want to look at how this particular product provides additional benefits to other comorbidities. Whatever the case may be, you need to start thinking about that and laying out that plan as early as possible to engage with various organizations that compile data, make data available for research purposes, so that you can start collecting or building the frameworks that are going to be required to obtain that information and have it available at the point at which you need it. Most of our clients' time is money, right? The longer it takes to address a particular question or concern, the less impactful that will be on their particular product. And so trying to be as thoughtful and as future looking as possible is essential in making sure that those enrichments are ready when you are to, to utilize them from a research perspective. So, Lou, it's clear that meeting different data needs is never simple. How does your team address those diverse requirements across pipelines and therapeutic areas? So, it starts by just being well-connected with our, our clients and with what's going on in the healthcare system in general. You know, there's, there's, there's a, you know, obviously a, a significant amount of work being done and published in journals and in other other media uh, formats, staying abreast of that is extremely important. You know, you look at the GLP ones that have been, and how that has exploded over the last few years, and you know the focus that's that's being put on into those areas from a development standpoint. A number of rare diseases have have seen a great deal of additional spotlight put on them for various aspects of. Um, advocacy and and just clinical development. And engaging with clients gives the perspectives of where their business challenges are and where they're looking to go from a future standpoint. And pulling that all together is a lot more art than it is science, but it's extremely important in terms of laying out the roadmap. And a lot of this focuses on what we make and how we make it available. We can't build enrichments for every disease area in the time that every customer wants it. And so that means we have to start thinking, we and others have to start thinking about alternative ways to make different types of data available to meet those needs. You know, there are thousands of diseases, right? There are thousands of products that are in development. There are thousands of products that are in market. It's a huge problem to try to keep up to keep up with. And as a result, it's it's got to be something that we focus on areas where there's a great deal of, of investment and making sure that we can handle those, evaluating key areas that are most impactful and most costly and most complicated in the healthcare system, but then be creative in novel ways of enabling organizations to conduct research or do their own enrichments in areas where we just can't get to number 75 on the list, you know, in the next year, it's going to be, you know, a year or two before we get there. And, you know, those patients have needs, those life science manufacturers have desires that they would like to, to, to utilize data to address. And from that standpoint, we have to make sure that we are balancing where we're making investments in enrichments with enabling access for people to do things on their own. And finally, looking ahead, what trends or developments are most likely to shape the role of real-world data over the next 12 to 18 months? I think the first and probably the the most impactful is is what does the FDA, Department of Health and Human Services, CDC, and some of the other regulatory agencies, what did they do? What where do they go? How do they modify the guidelines that have been published to date around real world evidence and the use of real world data in regulatory 
um, engagement, that has a tremendous uh, impact on shaping where and how um, real world data is utilized. I think the next biggest is in the area of precision medicine. You know, it's an area that we have, we've, we've, we've utilized that term quite extensively over a, a long period of time. It's still an area that we're all chasing after that ability to get more focused and targeted for different diseases to differentiate you and I from what product works the best for us. You know, we, we tend to take this approach today where there's a fair amount of trial and error, but we've seen a great deal of success in biomarkers over the last four or five years with cell and gene therapy. And that's only going to continue to grow. You know, as we, as we continue, as the, as, the, as the world, the population continues to age, as we all start to suffer from certain um, diseases that just eventually catch up to us, no matter how healthy we are, no matter how good our habits are, you know, there is some predisp predisposition to all of us based on our gen genetic makeup um, for certain conditions. And, you know, we have to be ready to, to meet them when and if they present themselves. And I think that those two areas are going to be the areas that guide what we do from a data perspective um, in terms of the enrichments that we make and how more precise we need to get in from a data perspective, how we collect it, how we manage it how we establish transparency and auditability so that we all have a great deal of comfort in the data being a solid foundation on which we're building all of these analytics to help the healthcare system work better for everybody. Well, thank you very much, Lou, for speaking with us today. We really appreciate your time and insights. It's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you very much for the very um, informative questions. And uh, I look forward to talking to you again soon. We look forward to learning more about how Optum Life Sciences supports better use of real world data across the industry. Thank you all for joining us for this X Talk Spotlight feature. We hope you enjoyed the discussion. <laughs>